turn to the book of 2 Chronicles in our Old Testament. The book of 2 Chronicles, as you are <clears throat> looking forward, I know, this week to celebrating uh, the 4th of July, I don't want us to miss the reality that America is in dire straits, spiritually speaking. I don't want us to be oblivious to the reality that the church in America is in dire straits. And I don't want us to be oblivious to the reality that we need a great awakening in this nation and we need revival in the church. Southern Baptist churches in 2016 planted, started several churches, added new churches, yet in 2016 we baptized fewer people, we had fewer members, and we had fewer members attending our churches, even though we increased the number of churches. The worst news, according to Chuck Kelly, is that when you put 2016, which is the last year of stats that he had to work with, when you put 2016 in the context of all the previous years it indicates that the Southern Baptist Convention is in the midst of a decline that shows no signs of slowing down or turning around and the Southern Baptist Convention is one of the most vibrant denominations in the nation as far as growth and numbers go and these are our statistics now let's think about the reality, and some of you know this from your own experience that you may still be grieving over, but 88% of high school graduates walk away from the church when they graduate high school. And I just want to put a, a little caveat on that to say that 88% of high schoolers walk away physically from the church when they graduate high school because they've already walked away from the church in their heart in middle school. According to stats, at least half of all Southern Baptist churches will close their doors by the year 2030 if things do not change. We need to experience revival in the church. We need to experience an awakening in this nation. It is very difficult to sing God Bless America when we realize that more than 54 million babies have been murdered in their mother's womb. Do you realize that that's wiping out the state of Tennessee not once, not twice, not three times, four times, five times, six times, or seven times, but almost eight times the population of Tennessee wiped off of the map through legalized Abortion. Approximately 40% of all births are illegitimate in this nation. Rampant immorality, divorce. And now, the unprecedented spread, growth, normalization, acceptance of homosexuality, and the legalization of pseudo homosexual marriage. In the words of Billy Graham's wife, Ruth Graham, if God does not judge America, he will have to resurrect Sodom and Gomorrah and give them an official apology. Now, I know that we link homosexuality to Sodom and Gomorrah, and that's the big, the big one, but I don't want us to miss the reality that God judged Sodom and Gomorrah for much more than that let me just give you this verse, Ezekiel 16, 49 to 50. Ezekiel clarifies this, and he says, Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. This is Ezekiel 16, 49 to 50. This was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance. She and her daughters had arrogance. Abundant food. Careless ease. Does that sound familiar? 
but she did not help the poor and needy. Thus they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore I removed them when I saw it. Sodomy was not the root that caused Sodom and Gomorrah to fall. It was the fruit. And the fruit came from the root which was their arrogance, their abundant food, their careless ease, and their lack of caring for the poor in the world. Again, I say, if we sing God Bless America, we need to say, for what? I mean, for what? God has already blessed America, and we built bigger houses, bought fancier vehicles, nicer clothes, saved up more, got our retirement accounts fatter, and taken nicer vacations. So God has blessed America, and we've fallen into the very trap that the Sodomites and, and the Gomorrahites fell into, according to Ezekiel 16, 49. We've lived in careless ease. We've stored it up for ourselves, and this nation is bearing the fruit of the root of our sin, of self-centeredness and arrogance and haughtiness and careless ease, and now we're seeing it fleshed out before our eyes, and we need God to do something. That is our only hope here this morning. It's for God to intervene in our churches and for God to intervene in this land. I want to say very clearly that the greatest threat to America is not ISIS. The greatest threat to America is not North Korea. The greatest threat to America is not even the devil himself. The greatest threat to America is God. The only hope we have is a great awakening in America and a mighty revival of the saints. I'm going to say something that's going to surprise you, I think. We have been here before. This, did you know that this country has been here before? At the turn of not the 21st century, not the 20th century, but the turn of the 19th at the turn of the 19th century, between 1790 and 1835, do you know what your nation was like between 1790 and 1835? And this land, between 1790 and 1835, colleges had banned the Bible and Christian teaching altogether on their campuses. Colleges were carrying out mock communion services in order to ridicule Christianity. A common topic of debate on college campuses was whether or not Christianity had been beneficial or detrimental to this new nation. And if you erred on the side of it being beneficial, you were ridiculed. And what tops this all off and puts a little icing on the cake is these were all, quote-unquote, Christian colleges. Chief Justice Marshall, at the turn of the 19th century, wrote to Bishop Madison of Virginia, and these are his exact words, the church is too far gone ever to be redeemed. And then... The second great awakening came. The second great awakening fell upon this land. And out of that second great awakening came one of the largest missionary sending movements in the history of the world. And I want to propose to you this morning as we look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7 that the thing we need here in this land and the thing we need in our churches is a third great awakening. And if God can do it at the turn of the 19th century, He can do it here in the 20th. 21st. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, beginning in verse 13, God is telling Solomon, He is telling King Solomon these words for the Jews as they have built the temple. And he's built his house, and they've built this kingdom. So this is for the Jews through Solomon. But we're going to glean some things from it this morning for us. Second Chronicles 7 and verse 13. God says, If I shut up the heavens, 
so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. That's where we are, whether we realize it or not, whether we recognize it or not, this is where we are. It is as if God has shut up the heavens. It is as if there is no spiritual rain on the land. It is as if the locusts have been set free to devour the land, and pestilence is among us. And God is saying, if this happens... Physically, Solomon, to the kingdom of Israel. And we're going to apply it spiritually here to us. Here's how you respond. And my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Let's pray. Father, we pray this morning as we enter into a week of celebrating and rejoicing another year as a nation that you would help us to pursue you and to pursue your glory as we long to see this land revived and awakened for the fame of your name to the ends of the earth. And we pray that you would teach us and help us this morning to listen to your voice, to not reject your voice or rebel against your voice, but to respond to your voice. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If my people... <clears throat> who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. In a sense, what we see here in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14 is a recipe for revival. It's a recipe for revival. And as I look at these verses, I see there's four major ingredients that we need to put in the oven this morning, so to speak, and trust God to do what is right with. There's four ingredients that I see here in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, that we need to make sure we have in the oven of our hearts and in the oven of First Baptist Tullahoma, if we're going to hope to see God respond with revival and respond with awakening. The first recipe, the first ingredient in this recipe is a people who are saved. Saved people. What does God tell Solomon? He says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. He's not talking about the Hittites. He's not talking about the Canaanites. He's not talking about the Hivites. He's not talking about any of those other parasites or termites out there. He's talking about the people in the house of God, the people who belong to him, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel, these people who were chosen by God to be his people upon this earth. He's saying, if you will humble yourselves and pray and turn from your wicked ways. Then I will hear. I'm not worried about what the lost world is doing. They're not expected to turn to me. They're not expected to cry out to me. They're not expected to humble themselves before me. I'm talking about my people. And our fault in the church today, for the most part, is that we want to point our finger out and we want to complain and we want to gripe and we want to blame everybody out there when the reality is judgment begins at the house of God. And we need to be looking in the mirror because we are the barometer. The Holy Spirit of God in us, working through us, is what sets the tone. So what we see out there is a reflection of what's happened in our hearts and in our churches. We've not, we've not been the light as bright as God has called us to be. And that's why darkness seems, seems to be prevailing for the time. This recipe for revival begins right here in our hearts if we are God's people. Think about it. How are you ever going to be revived if you've never been vived? 
You can't be revived if you've not been vibed. So this morning, we need to start right here and say, if we're going to see God do a work in our lives, if we're going to see God do a work in our families, if we're going to see God do a work in our church, in our, in our city, in our state, in our nation, in our world, then we need to step in front of the mirror and ask ourselves, am I a saved person? Am I one of God's people called by God's name? Have I really been brought into the family of God and the kingdom of God? Now, I'm not asking, have you walked down an aisle? I'm not asking, did you repeat a sinner's prayer? I'm not asking, did the pastor take your hand and give you the, the proverbial pastoral nod? I'm not asking you if you've been baptized. I'm not asking you if you've joined the church. There will be people in hell who have prayed the sinner's prayer, gotten baptized, joined the church, and fooled everybody around them. And that's why Jesus tells us that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because there's going to be a whole line of people who are saying, I said, Lord, Lord, I prayed, Lord, Lord, I ask you, Lord, Lord. And, and why? Because they did not do the will of my Father which is in heaven. So don't hear me asking you any of those questions. I'm asking you, has God snatched you out of darkness and brought you into His marvelous light? Has He made you a new creation? Has He taken out your heart of stone and replaced it with a heart of flesh? Has He put His Spirit within you? And is His Holy Spirit transforming the way you think and the way you talk and the way you act and the way you spend your money? Has your life been revolutionized by the gospel of Jesus Christ? If not, I want to encourage you to fall on your face before Him this morning and appeal to Him and plead with Him to give you new life. You cannot convince me or anyone else in this place this morning who is thinking logically that you know Jesus if there's not been a major transformation in your life. I've already used this illustration once, but I don't have many, so I use them all the time. So you just get bored with them, okay? But if I walked up here to this pulpit this morning and brushed off and said, guys, listen, I almost didn't make it. The train was coming, I was running late, and I tried to get across, and that thing hit the side of my truck running full speed, threw me out of the passenger's window. I mean, I went through the glass, hit the gravel, rolled, and for about 50 feet, finally got up, got across the tracks, and got here just in time to preach. I'm sorry I'm a little late, guys. You're going to look at me and think, you have lost your mind. There's no way you can get hit by a freight train at full speed and walk up there and preach a sermon. I'm going to tell you, Jesus is bigger than any freight train that runs up and down these tracks. He's more powerful than any freight train that runs up and down these tracks. And you will not convince me or anyone else who thinks logically that Jesus has hit you head on and you've not been changed. So this morning, as you look in the mirror, you need to ask yourself, has God really done a transformational work in my life? Has God really revolutionized my life? Has He turned my upside down world right side up? And am I a new creation? Have old things passed away and are old things continuing to pass away? And have all things been made new? Yes or no? If not, you need to turn away from your sin this morning. Turn away from your old affections this morning. Turn away from your old attitude this morning. Turn away from your old actions this morning. Turn loose of your old religious religious notions this morning. Turn away from your self-righteousness this morning and open yourself up to God and say, here I am, a sinner and I have nothing to bring to the table. I have nothing that I can offer you that is worth anything. God, I am at your mercy. I'm at your disposal. Turn away from all that you have. Come to the cross empty-handed. Look to Jesus Christ alone and cry out to him for mercy until he gives you assurance that you are indeed his child. We don't even need to talk about revival until we get beyond our religion and know that we are His people that have been called by His name. Saved people. If we read on in verse 14, we see that this is not only saved people, but these are supplicating people. 
supplicating people. He says, if my people who are called by my name will what? Humble themselves and pray. Humble themselves and pray. Those two things go right together like two sides of the same coin. Humble yourself and pray. That's supplicating before God. You've been brought to the place where you have been humbled before God and now all you can do is look to Him and cry out to Him in desperation. This is the recipe for revival. Saved people being brought low and turning in desperation to God. We need to humble ourselves. I'm talking about as individuals. I'm also talking about as pastors and as churches. We have gotten too big for our britches. With our resources, with our money, with our institutions, with our ideas, with our incessant new study that's coming out that's going to fix all of our problems. It's, we've gotten too big for our britches. We have become dependent upon ourselves. We've become dependent upon our buildings. We've become dependent upon our budgets. We've become dependent upon our programs. We've become dependent upon our resources. We've become dependent upon our leadership abilities rather than the power of God. And we need to humble ourselves as pastors and as churches claiming 1 Peter 5, 6 where he says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you at the proper time. And let me just say, free of charge, extra credit here this morning, God's proper time is never my proper time. It's always way later. But we must humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt us at the proper time. James 4.10 tells us, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. We need to humble ourselves as pastors. We need to humble ourselves as churches. We need to humble ourselves as individuals. We need to humble ourselves as a nation. And out of that humility, out of that desperation, comes prayer. We, we've got to come to the place where we will take off our Make America Great hats and put on some Make America Humble sackcloth if we really want to see God make America great. We need to replace American pride with American humility that will drive us to prayer and to dependence on the one that we say we believe has brought us to this place. And out of that desperation and humility and sackcloth and ashes will come prayer and looking to Christ for help and for hope. The church, its pastors, and its people have to find their way back to their knees. E.M. Bounds said what the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use. Men of prayer. Men mighty in prayer. John Bunyan said you can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you can do no more than pray until you've prayed. If we're going to see any hope for awakening and any hope for revival in this land, we've got to be saved people and we've got to be supplicating people who have been brought low in desperation for God to do something that turns us to Him in prayer. And then thirdly, we need to be seeking people. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Notice that he did not say, seek my hand. He did not say, seek my blessings. He did not say, seek my favor. But seek my face. It's like Mary and Martha. Martha's seeking Jesus' approval by working and working and doing and doing and doing and there's nothing wrong with working and doing because if we didn't have Martha's we wouldn't eat and the house would be a mess, right? But Mary is sitting at his feet just gazing into 
his face. And Jesus says, Martha, calm down. Mary has chosen the better thing. And I think that's what God is saying to us if we're saved people who have been brought to desperation and turn our hearts to God in prayer as our only hope for revival and awakening. We just need to stop and bask in the wonder and the glory and the beauty and the majesty of His face and who He is. We need to seek God, not His hand. We need to seek God, not just His blessings. We need to seek God, not just His favor. We need to seek Him. What do we come into this place seeking? We come seeking to ha- see how full our pews are. We come seeking to see how big our Sunday school numbers are. We come in here seeking to see how much offering we take up. We come in here seeking to see who might come to the altar. We come in here seeking to see how many folks God saved. We come in here seeking all of these things. And all those things are great. All of those things are important. But how many of us come into this place seeking God? Seeking God. We often get so wrapped up in the results of God that we neglect the face of God. We get so wrapped up in the things of God that we miss God. I'll never, you'll you'll never believe this story, but it's true. I'm standing up here telling you the truth. Went fishing one time, and I'm kind of a cheapskate. I'll confess that. And I bought me a $2 spinnerbait, and I went fishing with a guy in the church, and I was throwing that spinnerbait, and I got it, you know, I caught a limb, Bram. I'll confess, we were out in the boat, and I, I wrapped it around a little willow tree limb or some kind of tree limb, and uh, I'm trying to get my spinnerbait out of the tree. Well, I'm not going to leave it. I've, I mean, I just spent $2 on this thing, so I'm pulling the boat over there, you know, like reeling it in, so I'm getting my spinnerbait back. Well, as I'm standing to get the spinnerbait out of the tree, the guy in the back of the boat says, you better sit down and be still and cut your line. And he starts backing the boat up with his trolling motor as fast as he can. Right there, about three feet from my spinnerbait, was a hornet's nest about this big around. And I'd been shaking that thing and and stirring those guys up. And I'm going to tell you something. I was so focused on a $2 lure that I just about missed what was really going to make a difference that day. And we come in here, and we're so focused on a $2 lure that we miss the God that we've gathered here for. I mean, what are we here for this morning? Is it to meet our friends? Is it to fellowship? Is it to hear our favorite song? Is it to see what's going on in the church? Is it to catch up on the news? Nothing necessarily wrong with any of those things, but I'm going to tell you what we need to be here for first and foremost today, and that is to gather into this place to seek and to get hold of God and leave here with Him. We need God. Until He is the object of our desire and until we are willing to lay aside all for Him, there will be no revival. The psalmist said in Psalm 63 and verse 1, O God, Thou art my God, I shall seek Thee earnestly. My soul thirsts for Thee. My flesh yearns for Thee. He doesn't need anything or anybody. He just needs God. Jeremiah 29, 13, God said, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. What did Jesus say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm going to tell you, if you ever get to the place where your desire is for nothing more than to get hold of God you'll have a measure of revival. Lastly, sorrowful people. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Notice he didn't say confess their wicked sins. We do that all the time. We are always confessing our sins. Or as the politicians like to call them now, their, their, their mistakes or their misjudgments, however you want to title it. But revival will come when we turn from our wicked ways. Not just confess our sin, but turn away from our sin. We have to want the presence of God more than we want our pet sin or our pet idol. 
Ezekiel 18, 30 to 32, Repent and turn away from all your transgressions so that iniquity may not become a stumbling block to you. Cast away from you all your transgressions which you have committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Repent and live. This is an ingredient in the recipe for you and me to look in the mirror and see what type of sin that we are harboring in our hearts, big or small. What kind of iniquity we have hidden away back here, big or small. What kind of transgression we keep presumptuously sinning with in the face of God, big or small. And we need to do some serious, serious repenting and turning away from our sin. One sin in the camp can cause grief to the whole camp. And do you remember back in Joshua chapter 7? The children of Israel have just come off of a major victory. And an unprecedented victory because they didn't really even have to pick up a sword. They just picked up the trumpets and they marched around the city of Jericho. Every day, for six days, on the seventh day, they marched seven times. They blew their trumpets. They shouted. And what happened to the walls? They come crashing down on this mighty city, Jericho. And Jericho is defeated. They're coming off of this wonderful victory. And they come up against another little place called Ai. A-I. And they send the spies up and they come back and they say, Listen, guys, we just came off of this victory in Jericho. This little place is nothing compared to Jericho. We don't need to send the whole army up. We just need to send two or 3,000 guys up there. We can take I and we can move on towards the promised land. So Joshua musters 3,000 men and they go up to I and they begin to go against the city. And the Bible says that those 3,000 men tucked tail and ran. The people of I put them on the run, killed 36 of them. They come back and they report to Joshua. And Joshua crumbles and falls and wants wonders, what is happening, God? You just conquered an entire city without us picking up a sword, and now we can't defeat this little community of people. And God says, Joshua, I'm not going to be with you if there's sin in the camp. There's some devoted things that are hidden away there that I'm not happy about. So Joshua gets everybody together. And he says, here's what I'm going to do. We're going to line up every tribe, and we're going to draw lots. We're going to cast lots, and we're going to find out who it is. Who it is that's responsible for this defeat. So he lines up all the tribes, and they draw lots. And the tribe of Judah is drawn. So all the other tribes are set aside, and all the tribe of Judah is before Joshua and he says now we're going to divide up into clans and we're going to cast lots and see which clan the lot falls upon and they drew lots and it lands upon the Zerahites all the other clans are dismissed he says now we're going to line up you families we're going to separate you out by families we're going to see who the lot falls upon and the lot falls upon the family of Zabdi and then he lines up the people from this family and he draws lots. And lot, the lots fall upon a man by the name of Achan. And he says, what have you done, Achan? And Achan said, I saw, I saw a really beautiful shawl and some silver and a big block of gold and I coveted it. You know, we, we go over those Ten Commandments and we sort of breeze over that last one, the covet one. That's the one that caused all this problem. I coveted the silver and the gold and the shawl and I took it and I buried it in the bottom of my tent and the men turned out and they went and they went to Achan's tent and they found the silver, they found the gold, they found the shawl, they brought it back and they put Achan and his family, his wife and his children, his silver, his gold and his shawl all into a circle and they stoned them all to death until they piled up a heap of stones over them all that remained there until this book was written at least. 
And then they turned around and they went up and they took I. I wonder if we're ever going to truly see revival in the church and awakening in this land as long as we, the people of God, harbor and hang on to secret sins. And some not so secret. We continue to just breeze over sin. And we continue to just sweep sin under the rug. And we continue to just overlook sin and ignore sin because we don't want to hurt any feelings. And we want to show the love of Jesus so we just pretend like it's not there. And we look the other way. And what we're, not, what we're doing is not showing the love of Jesus when we don't lead people to repent of their sins. The most unloving thing I can do for you week after week is to come in here and tell you how awesome you all are and how good you all are and everything's wonderful and everything's good. I mean, it sounds like a K-Love song. I know and we all go home feeling better. It's the most unloving thing I can ever do for you. Because when you stand before God and get in front of His perfect holiness, perfect righteousness, and are measured by His perfect standard, all of the sweet sermons and all of the encouraging words and all of the, the, the Joel Osteenisms are not going to stand in the presence of a holy God, no matter how good they make you feel on this side. The most loving thing a man of God or a woman of God can do for us is to confront us with the holiness of God and the standard of God and say we need to be on our face before this God, pleading for His mercy, pleading for His grace, repenting of our sin, and being transformed so that when we stand before Him, we can stand before Him unashamed. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, Do not quench the Spirit. Do you realize that our sin has the capability of quenching the Spirit of God? Ephesians 4.30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Our sin, even gossip, even bad attitudes, can grieve God's Spirit. If we're going to see revival, we must be sorrowful over our secret sins, our acceptable sins, and turn away from them. These are the ingredients for revival. Saved people, supplicating people, seeking people, sorrowful people. Will we be those people? Are you saved this morning? Have you been brought to the place where you see our great need and you can only turn one way and that's to Christ in desperation through prayer? Have you been given a hunger and a passion and a desire to know God and to get hold of God and to experience God so that everything else becomes dim? In the light of His glory and His grace? Has God put His finger on a sin or sins in your life, secret, acceptable, that you need to turn away from this morning? As we hope to seek God do a work in our church, in our lives, and in our land. I long for revival. I love revival. I'm not talking about Sunday through Wednesday special meetings. I'm talking about revival where God shows up and just wrecks our worlds. He brings us so near to Him. I, I long to see another awakening. And I've read about every re recorded revival from Acts 2 to the present. I don't remember m most of what I read. And most of what I study, but one thing stands out to me from all that I read and all that I studied, and it is this. Revivals do not come in like tsunamis. Revivals throughout history don't come in like tsunamis. They come in like a major river flood. Little branches and little creeks and little tributaries and little rivers fill up, swell up, and pour into the big river that then floods the land. That's how revivals happen. And it is my hope and it is my prayer 
And it's my desire that we could be just one of those little branches. We could be one of those little streams, one of those little creeks, one of those little rivers that, that comes together into the big river of the church of Jesus Christ. And we flood this land and bring revival. I want to pray with the psalmist in Psalm 85 and verse 6. Will you not revive us again? that your people may rejoice in you. Let's pray. Father, we ask this this morning, that you would revive us. That you would look across this room and you would put your finger on the hearts and the minds and the lives of individuals and that you would stir our hearts Humble us. Help us to pray. Help us to seek you. To seek your face. Point out our sin. and Help us. Give us the strength and the grace to turn away from our sin. Once and for all. God, send a revival. Send a revival to our families. God, we pray for a, a revival for this church. We pray for an awakening in this land. We need you. And it's in your name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Would you stand as we sing? You respond as the Lord would lead you to respond this morning.